Chronic or recurrent rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps, or CRS-SNP, is characterized by a persistent inflammation of the sinonasal mucosa. The underlying cause is unclear, but could changes in the sinonasal microbiome be a potential driver of this disease? We investigate. This is Euphoria News Broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News, I'm Dr. David Bull. Chronic or recurrent rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps, or CRS-SNP, affects between 5 to 12% of the population and is characterised by persistent inflammation of the sinonasal mucosa. Despite this common presentation, the underlying cause of the condition remains unclear. Treatment has historically relied on the use of antibiotics, anti-inflammatory drugs and surgery. Now these measures do reduce symptoms temporarily, but long-term results are often unsatisfactory. We now know that the paranasal sinuses are not sterile in healthy individuals. They are, in fact, colonised by commensal bacteria. And these bacteria make up the microbiome. It now appears that disturbances in the makeup of the microbiome by pathogens or indeed by the use of antibiotics may promote chronic rhinosinusitis. So the question that arises then is, can symptoms of CRS be improved by transplanting the microbiome from a healthy person? Well, here to shed light on the microbiome and the possibilities that microbiome transplantation could offer is Professor Anders Servin. He is Professor of Otorhinolaryngology at Lund University in Sweden. He's also internationally well known for his experience and research into chronic rhinosinusitis. And he is also clinical lead of the research project. Professor, thank you so much uh, for joining me. I find this really fascinating. Can we start at the beginning? And if you would be kind enough to talk us through what the microbiome is and how it might differ in patients with CRS to those who are healthy individuals. Um, well, thanks for having me. So the microbiome is a, a combination of all uh, microorganisms in, in a certain, certain anatomical space, for example, the sinuses the, or the nasal cavity. To ask, but just, just in terms of the microbiome in healthy individuals and those patients with CRS, how do we think they might differ? It's a, it's a very, we, we definitely thought there was a huge difference, you know, initially when we started our studies, uh, you know, uh, uh, the whole scientific community had, had sort of a hoping for sort of key species that will explain health and explain disease, but that's not the case. Um, so there's a surprising small difference at times, but uh, in, a path in, a, in a patient's microbiome, you will probably see growth of fewer species. So you have less diversity um, and you will have a, maybe an abundance of some certain pathogens, whereas in a healthy microbiome, you will uh, have a much larger diversity and the pathogens would be in low abundance and would be sort of suppressed uh, by the um, other sort of uh, probiotic uh, species. Now, you published a paper, uh, which I have here, uh, which was actually published in the International Forum of, of Allergy and Rhinology Journal. It was published at the end of last year, and it details a study that you carried out. Can you tell us about that study? Yes, we were frustrated with our sort of traditional treatment of the patient with purulent chronic sinusitis, you know, with, with um, crusting and a miserable quality of life. They all had surgery in the past, uh, sometimes multiple surgeries. They've been on long uh, courses of antibiotics with no long-term benefit. So this is the group we, we targeted. And we thought uh, maybe if we can help them to sort of... Uh, retune their microbiome uh, to a more diverse microbiome. And we were, of course, inspired by the fecal transplant that was published, I think, in 2013 in New England Journal of Medicine. And so you looked at this in terms of um, a microbiome transplantation. How do you do that? Where does the healthy microbiome actually come from? Well, in this particular trial, we asked our patients what would be an acceptable donor. 
and most patients uh, uh, chose their spouse uh, if they had a you know a, a sinus healthy partner uh, and that uh, turned out to work really well in a few cases we used you know some of the study staff to uh, sinus healthy so um, just just reading this, the, the nasal microbiome transplant were obtained, as you said, from the healthy individuals. They were administered as nasal lavages to the patients uh, with CRS uh, SNP. So what did the results actually show at the end of the study? So well, well, <clears throat> what was surprising to us was that we had a long term benefit. So even 87 days, which was the last visit after end of treatment, we still had 16 patients with an significant uh, improvement in SNOT 22 scores, and also a significant improvement in the diversity of the microbiome, which I think sort of uh, <clears throat> supports our clinical finding. And uh, were you surprised by the results? I mean, they seem quite striking to me, the fact that the patients, as you said, uh, many of them actually improved in terms of their symptomatology. W were, you, were you surprised by what you found? And also, what do you do with those results now? We were, well, I was definitely surprised. I was a bit skeptical, you know, but we've tried, we had a number of trials where we used different probiotic species, which has a very good interfering capacity to kill off the common sinus pathogens, but that didn't work at all. So we, in the end, we said, we just need to do something else. And then we'll try, uh, you know, a, a snot transplant where you have not only the microbiome, but you also probably get, you know, immunoglobulins and everything else that's secreted into the nasal mucosal surfaces. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, we need to do, we, we're just starting a randomized controlled trial back in Brisbane, where I used to be the professor of rhinology at the University of Queensland. And uh, uh, we just uh, enrolled our first patient in that trial. So hopefully that will shed a bit more light over this treatment option, you know, if it's viable. How absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Professor Anders Servin. Thanks for having me. Well, joining me now also from Sweden is Dr. Anders Mortensen. He is ENT consultant at Hellingsborg Hospital. He is the first author of the study that I mentioned and an extremely experienced investigator in CRS clinical trials. Really good uh, to see you. First of all, I've just been talking to Professor Servin about the study. Could you tell us a little bit about the practicalities involved and also how well did the CRS patients tolerate the microbiome transplantation in the study? Uh, well, thanks for having me, David. Uh, the patients tolerated the microbiome transplant surprisingly well. Uh, most of them reported symptoms as of the common cold during the five days of the transplant procedure. Uh, two patients reported infection, acute infection symptoms uh, during and shortly after the study, but both resolved well without any medical intervention. So, so just in terms of the microbiome itself, I found it really interesting in the previous discussion about the differences that may exist between the microbiome of a healthy patient and a microbiome of someone with CRS. So what component do you believe the, of the healthy microbiome might be responsible for the effects seen in the study, for the improvement in symptoms? Well, when we designed the study back around 2016, the current research indicated big differences regarding abundance and diversity between the microbiota of the CRS patients and healthy subjects. Uh, since then, bigger and newer studies have not been able to show that kind of uh, differences. So my personal belief is that there are other components of the microbiome such as bacterial metabolites and possibly the bacteria producing those that have caused the symptom alleviation in our patients. So, so just in terms of where you go from now, what do you believe needs to be done to follow up on your study? Uh, Dr. Professor Anders Savin's team in Australia are planning to conduct uh, another version of the microbiome transfer study, this time with the placebo arm. Uh, further, we are planning to look into the differences between CRS patients and healthy subjects regarding uh, metabolomics and proteomics to see if we can see any differences there. So, so tell me, what needs to be done from here in terms of follow-up? And, and what's your prediction for the future of microbiome transplantation? Uh, for follow-up, uh, 
clearly we need a trial with a placebo arm as well. And, and also we need to look further into what components of the microbiome transfer are really helping the patients uh, and try to sort that out better. And just on a very personal note, what did the patients make of this? When I far, first asked the patients if they wanted to participate in the trial, they all said that it, it sounded like a really terrible thing to do. But uh, when I asked them again, they said they, they were willing to do anything to get better from their CRS symptoms. So at the end, end of the day, having done that trial and looking forward, I mean, you must be gently excited about the, the future and where this goes. I am very excited about the future and uh, really looking forward to do further research into this field. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. That's Dr. Anders Mortensen. Thank you, Dr. David Bull. Well, that's it for this Euphoria News. Many thanks to my guests, to Professor Anders Servin and Drs. Anders Mortensen. Really fascinating stuff. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and also register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on social media, on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. But until next time, goodbye.